The largest hot desert in the world, the Sahara, is one of the driest places on Earth, with rainfall basically non-existent in many parts, and what little water does reach the Sahara disappears rapidly with a rate of potential evaporation ranging from a low of 2,500 to a high of 6,000 millimeters per year, which is 100 to 240 inches, the highest ever recorded. For reference, potential evaporation in the vicinity of Phoenix, Arizona, in the Sonoran Desert, maxes out at about 2,500 millimeters per year. With this incredible dryness and evaporation in mind, the Sahara seems like the last place that you'd imagine a sea. But if any videos about mega projects has taught us anything, it's that humanity loves a bit of a challenge. Making an inland sea in the Sahara Desert has been an engineering dream since at least the 19th century, and it's persisted to the present day with a project currently under development in cooperation with the Tunisian government. The first recorded proposal for a project creating an inland sea in the Sahara Desert was by Donald Mackenzie, a Scottish entrepreneur and avid abolitionist who set up a trading post along the West African coast that often dealt in goods from Central Africa that had to be transported across the Sahara by caravan. Of course, this journey took weeks and had a limited capacity. Mackenzie himself had not traveled into Central Africa, which was then referred to as the Sudan, with an OU, not the same as the country now called Sudan, but he had heard many descriptions of the terrain from traders and nomads. He came to believe that an area known as El Juf in modern-day Mauritania near the border with Mali was sufficiently below sea level that if connected to the Atlantic Ocean over a thousand kilometers away, that's 650 miles, it would create a large sea of more than 150,000 square kilometers, roughly 60,000 square miles. That's nearly twice the size of Lake Superior. He believed this would even allow for canals connecting to the Niger River. European ships could then travel all the way to the Sudan and gain access to its rich resources that had otherwise been difficult to access. As a side benefit, the sea would also allow for agriculture in the arid region and, in keeping with Mackenzie's political beliefs, help liberate the Central African population from the slave trade that was prolific in the area. Mackenzie was likely inspired by other smaller depressions that he had seen near the Atlantic coast, such as the Serb Qatar, which is just 15 kilometers or 10 miles off of the Atlantic and 55 meters or 180 feet below sea level. He was also aware of various salt lakes that formed seasonally in depressions in Tunisia and Egypt. However, the fatal flaw in his proposal was that he was entirely incorrect about the elevation of El Juf, which is actually about 320 meters or about 1,000 feet above sea level. Mackenzie's proposal actually gained a lot of press coverage, with popular publications like the Daily Telegraph and Vanity Fair praising the potential of the plan and encouraging serious consideration. Nevertheless, his flooding the Sahara project didn't receive much investment, and he ultimately abandoned it for other ambitions such as founding the successful Northwest Africa Trading Company and working to promote abolitionism in East Africa. By the 1870s, Ferdinand de Lesseps was one of the most famous Frenchmen in the world. Thanks to his work developing the Suez Canal, which had opened in 1869, the French government had made him a Viscount, and the press referred to him as Le Grand Francais, or the Great Frenchman. Apparently, though, he had further ambitions, because he partnered with the military geographer Francois Elie Ruder to create a proposal for connecting the Gulf of Garb in the Mediterranean Sea to the Shot El Fage, a seasonal salt lake in Tunisia that lies below sea level and is dry for most of the year. Based on plans published by Ruder in Revue de Dumont in 1874, the proposed sea would be connected to the Mediterranean by a canal 190 kilometers or 120 miles long and have a surface area of some 5,000 square kilometers, that's 3,000 square miles, twice the size of Utah's Great Salt Lake. De Lesseps and Ruder had a lot of different rationales for the project, all of which they used to drum up public support. One of these was the interesting idea that an inland sea in Tunisia would actually improve the weather in Europe. 
Additionally, Rudaire, a captain in the French army, also saw the sea as a strategic boon for France's geopolitical plans in North Africa. The Berlin Conference was right around the corner, and the scramble for Africa, in which France would occupy Tunisia as a protectorate, began just a few years later in 1881. Although France ultimately didn't face any resistance when they invaded Tunisia, Rudaire foresaw the inland sea as a way to isolate the rebellious tribes in the south, making the pacification of the region much easier. In fact, French imperialism played a large role in the popularity of the plan. In the late 19th century, nationalism was on the rise, and the great powers of Europe were in intense rivalries, not just for colonies, but for reputation. Well read, Rudaire believed that Chaut el Faget was actually the location of the Bay of Triton, a body of water described in ancient Greek texts. According to Greek mythology, a descendant of the legendary Argonauts would one day come and establish 100 Greek cities around the bay. Symbolically, recreating the Bay of Triton would show that France was the inheritor of the enlightened European values that originated in Greece, and also it was the rightful successor to the Roman Empire, as opposed to her rival powers like Britain, Germany, and Italy. This informed the French vision of the white man's burden. The campaign to civilize Africa, a continent the European powers saw as riddled with social problems such as slavery and corruption, as well as environmental obstacles like a giant non-arable desert. In fact, Rudaire was able to recruit de Lesseps to the plan in the first place by convincing him that the inland sea would greatly improve the climate and therefore economic conditions of Algeria and Tunisia. The evaporating water could theoretically produce clouds that would stabilize temperatures and streams that normally dried before re reaching the chart would become rivers, irrigating the surrounding land for agriculture. Plus, the sea would allow for easier commerce in the area. All of this would presumably improve the local standard of living. Delessus was able to convince the Science Academy of the plan's feasibility, and the French government subsequently gave Rudaire a budget of 35,000 francs to do an in-depth study of the area. He undertook two expeditions, but his findings were disappointing. Much less of the area was below sea level than he thought, especially the part closer to the Mediterranean. He and Delessops had to change their plan to include a much longer canal and a smaller sea, and the French scientific community decided that it was no longer feasible and would cost over a billion francs, far more than the initial estimate of 25 million francs. A French franc in 1880 was worth about 0.29 grams of gold, so a billion francs is something around $17 billion in today's currency. but changing currencies over such a long distance doesn't really work very well. What it was, was very, very expensive. The French government pulled their financing, but de Lesseps and Rudaire were committed. Using their own money, they founded La Société d'Etudes de la Mer Intérieure Africaine, or the Society for African Inland Sea Studies, and Rudaire went back to Tunisia for another expedition. He returns with a fever to both the scientific and military community that were highly critical of his obsession with the Inland Sea, and he died shortly after at the age of 48. De Lesseps and Rudaire's research society continued on. But it lowered its ambitions to stabilizing an agricultural colony near the Bay of Gar using wells. Even this proved too much, and the society dissolved in 1892. De Lesseps focused on his plans for the Panama Canal, which ultimately ended in a bribery scandal which landed him in prison in 1893. He died a year later. Nevertheless, the plan stuck in the French imagination. Other French scientists continued bringing up the idea throughout the 20th century, and it also inspired the development of various canals in Tunisia. Still, Rudaire's vision only ever became realized in fiction. The famous author Jules Verne, often considered the father of science fiction, included the proposal in his 1905 novel The Invasion of Sea, in which Berbers and Europeans fight over the plans, after which, spoiler alert, an earthquake ends up creating it without human involvement. In the mid-20th century, it was the Americans' turn to take up the aspiration of a sea in the Sahara. Their idea was a bit more dramatic, though. Blow a crater in the desert with nuclear bombs. Far from a fringe idea, the proposal was part of Project Plowshare, a program of the United States federal government aimed at finding peaceful engineering purposes for nuclear explosives. Started in 1957, the project was part of the Global Atoms for Peace initiative promoted by President Dwight D. Eisenhower in 1953. Project Plowshare got pretty creative for Sahara and Sea, arguably not even the most ambitious proposal. For example, Project Carriol would have cut through the Bristol Mountains in the Mojave Desert to make way for Interstate 40 and the Santa Fe Railway using 22 nuclear explosions. 
There were also proposals for mining and other subterranean purposes, like connecting underground aquifers and reaching oil and natural gas deposits. However, Project Plowshare's biggest focus seems to have been manipulating waterways. One of the first proposals to gain serious traction uh, was Project Chariot, a plan to create a completely artificial harbor in Cape Thompson on the northwestern coast of Alaska, ultimately abandoned because several studies using fallout transported to the area from nuclear test sites showed that it would adversely affect the local environment and population. In fact, villagers from nearby Point Hope who had experienced elevated rates of cancer were outraged some 30 years later when these experiments were revealed, prompting the government to remove the buried fallout. Even grander proposals included widening the Panama Canal, creating an entirely new Panatomic Canal through Nicaragua, and carving out an alternative route to the Suez Canal through the Negev Desert in Israel to the Gulf of Aqaba on the Red Sea. This latter proposal would have required carving out a waterway over 250 kilometers long, which is more than 160 miles and over 25% longer than the Suez Canal itself, using 520 nuclear warheads, each with a 2 megaton blast, 125 times more powerful than the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima. This radical plan gained traction because the Suez Canal had become a major strategic playing piece in the Cold War, especially after the Egyptian government had nationalized it in 1956, leading to the Suez crisis. The US all wanted an alternative in an allied nation. Though perhaps overshadowed by these more dramatic proposals, officials involved in Project Plowshare also proposed nuclear weapons as the solution to the Saharan Sea problem. One idea was to use 213 1.5 megaton nuclear bombs as part of the Katara Depression project that aimed to create an inland sea in northern Egypt. The explosion would be used to carve out a canal from the Mediterranean Sea to the depression, uh, which lies about 60 meters, or nearly 200 feet, below sea level. This uh, would create an inland sea with high amounts of evaporation, leading to a constant inflow of water that could be exploited for hydroelectric power. Some even proposed using nuclear explosions to revisit De Lesseps and Rudaire's plans for the shots of Tunisia, but none of these plans came to fruition. Increasing global resistance to nuclear technology, especially after the Cuban Missile Crisis, caused Project Plowshare to lose steam until funding ceased entirely in 1977. De Lesseps and Rudaire's idea for an inland sea in the Chots of Tunisia was finally revived in the 21st century by a non-profit organization called Cooperation Road, or Coro. Formed by professionals and experts in Mediterranean cooperation from around the world, Coro wants to construct a canal from the Gulf of Garb that uh, would flood the Chots just like the original 19th century French proposal. Coro claims that the project will massively benefit Tunisia and the entire Mediterranean region in a number of ways. A nation with around 35% youth unemployment, the economy uh, would benefit from a large number of new jobs. The inland sea would also hinder desertification, the evaporation from the sea causing increased rainfall and cloud cover. These climate changes could provide for agriculture, fish farming, and animal husbandry in the surrounding area, in addition to increased tourism. Finally, economic improvements would decrease migration out of Tunisia towards the European Union, Italy in particular, and instead make Tunisia itself a magnet for migrant labor in North Africa. Coro's Sea in the Sahara is still in its preliminary stages, but it did receive approval from the Tunisian government in 2018. With almost 150 years of history, it definitely seems like a sea in the Sahara is an idea that humanity refuses to give up on. Though relegated to the pages of Jules Verne for now, it might not be long before someone finally finds a way to flood the desert. <laughs>